Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up with fine books sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience, and today we bring you the story of how the 1960 United States men's Olympic basketball team was selected for the Olympic Games in Rome that summer. Now, some of this I covered back in episode 121 on the 1960 Olympic team, but this time I am going to go deeper into the actual selection election process and bring out some of the drama that occurred between the powers that be to select the 12 players that were going to represent the United States at the Olympics. Now, as I mentioned in that previous episode, the United States national basketball team, both men's and women's, are currently under the direction of an organization called USA Basketball. Previously, it was run by Jerry Colangelo, the former owner of the Phoenix Suns. However, today, that organization is run by Hall of Famer, Grant Hill. Now, to be clear, it is a separate organization from the United States Olympic team, which oversees almost every other Olympic sport on behalf of the United States. However, USA Basketball does have an agreement with the U.S. Olympic Committee to be in charge of the basketball teams and to select the rosters for Olympics, World Championships, and other international events. But USA Basketball is a relatively newer organization. It used to be the Amateur Athletic Union or AAU that was in charge of selecting the Olympic basketball team. After all, they were most familiar with the best amateur players in the country. Later, the AAU partnered with the NCAA since it became mostly college players that participated. And the AAU had a huge influence over amateur basketball in the United States because the AAU teams were as good or better than some of the best college teams in America. From the 1930s to around 1960s, some of the best amateur basketball around was played in the AAU. And that made the AAU very powerful when it came time to form the Olympic team every four years because everybody knew that some of the best amateurs in the country were grown men who had already ended their college careers and were now playing in one of the top AAU teams. And by the way, back then the AAU still had a men's division. Vision. Today, while the AAU still exists, it only governs middle school and high school level basketball. The 1940s and 50s was still considered the heyday of the AAU as they still had a men's division. Now, one could argue that the very best AAU teams of the late 1940s could beat or at least give an NBA team a real run for its money. Now, the format for selecting Team USA was to invite eight teams for a national tournament. The format for the 1960 selection process was no different. There were two AAU teams that participated, the national champion Phillips 66ers and the runner-up Akron Goodyears. There was also the champions of the National Industrial League, the Peoria Caterpillars, another amateur team. Then there was a military team which participated that was made up of the best players from the Army and Navy basketball leagues. Finally, four NCAA teams participated, the national champion Ohio State University, along with a team made up of college all-stars to be coached by Pete Newell, the coach that had finished as the runner-up at the NCAA tournament. And there were also the two finalists from the NIT tournament. Both Bradley University and Providence College made their appearance at this national level tournament. The way that the tournament worked is that whichever team won this selection tournament would place their five starters 
occurs automatically on the Olympic team along with its head coach as the Olympic head coach. The coach of the second place team would become the assistant coach for the Olympics and the remaining seven roster spots would automatically include one player from the military team, at least two of the AAU players, and at least two of the NCAA players. The final two spots were wild cards, meaning that the committee would select the two best remaining players from any team for that Olympic roster. For the previous several Olympics, the roster was dominated by AAU players as the AAU teams proved to have the best amateur players and coaches in the United States, even better than some of the college teams. But in 1960, a very unusual thing happened at the tournament that nobody expected, and it knocked the AAU leadership down by so many pegs that their influence over the USA national team immediately diminished. And I'll be right back with that upset after this break. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of you Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment. But first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift, sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out! Don't wait! Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art, evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the selection of the 1960 USA basketball team for the Rome Olympics. Now, as I mentioned before the break, the AAU teams usually dominated the selection tournament because these teams are made up of grown men who are often as good as any NBA team or players. The college teams were made up of guys mostly age 21 and under, and they were still developing as players. Then there was the military team, 
also made up of grown men who played a very physical style of ball due to their training for actual war. The college all-star team coached by Pete Newell only had two days of practices to prepare for the selection tournament. Now, this was not a lot of time considering that all the rest of the teams, barring the military team, had been playing together all season long. The college all-star team was at a major disadvantage. However, Pete Newell was no average coach and the players on his team were no average players. His starters included Jerry West, Oscar Robertson, Jay Arnett, Daryl Imhoff, and Terry Dishinger, all future NBA players, and four of them became All-Stars, and three of them became Hall of Famers. Pete Newell used future Hall of Famer Walt Bellamy as his sixth man. Newell felt that putting Bellamy out there with West and Robertson as starters was just too much firepower, so he decided to make Bellamy part of the second unit so that Bellamy would go wild over the other team's reserve players. Now that was dangerous for Bellamy because it meant that if the All-Star team won the selection tournament, he may not get chosen for the Olympic team because he was not a starter. Only starters went automatically. And the college All-Stars shocked everyone at the tournament when they defeated the Phillips 66ers team by a score of 96 to 79. That was a solid defeat. Most people thought that maybe they just got lucky, but then they defeated the Akron Goodyears 108 to 88. Again, another solid beatdown. These college All-Stars were to be taken seriously. These grown AAU players could not keep up with the likes of Jerry West and Oscar Robertson. And they could not keep Walt Bellamy and Daryl Imhoff off the boards. The college All-Stars then destroyed the Peoria Caterpillars by a score of 124 to 97 in the championship game. It was clear to everyone with eyes that the college All-Stars were clearly better than any of these amateur teams made up of grown men. In the four years since 1956, it became obvious that the AAU and other adult men's amateur leagues were no longer the best amateurs in the country. And there is one good reason for that. The talent in the AAU was being depleted. Any good player good enough to play in the NBA was playing in the NBA. The salaries that the NBA was starting to pay by the end of the 1950s was so large that the best college players could no longer say no to an NBA career. That meant that the AAU teams were no longer getting some of the best players out of college anymore. And this was a huge blow to AAU leadership. They fully expected that one of their teams would win the tournament and be able to send at least seven AAU players to the Olympics. But things backfired right in their faces. The first five spots on the Olympic team went to the five starters of the all-star team that won the tournament. Plus, the next two best NCAA players from any of the college teams. That meant that seven of the roster spots were automatically going to NCAA players, along with one spot for that best player from the military team. That left, at most, only four spots for the AAU teams, and those four players would likely not even be starters for the Olympic teams. Now, this was terrible news for the AAU. In those few hours after the end of the tournament, the selection committee, made up mostly of AAU guys and a couple of NCAA representatives, went into a conference room and made the final roster selections. Pete Newell had a chance to address the selection committee and expressed assumptions that Bellamy would make the Olympic team even though he was not a starter. The guy was easily the best rebounder in the tournament. The only reason that he did not start was for strategic reasons. The selection committee said that they were not sure because that would mean sending six players from the same team. That is when Pete Newell, who was usually mild-mannered, blew his stack. He reminded every one of those selection committee members that for the previous two Olympics, they sent six players from the same AAU team. So they better send six players from his all-star team to Rome. It was basically a showdown between Newell and the selection committee, and they really were unsure of what to do. And I cannot stress this enough. They truly thought that an AAU team would win the selection tournament, allowing them to send at least seven AAU players to Rome. They were between a rock and a hard place, and they could see their influence going down the drain right in front of their eyes. Pete Newell waited outside of the conference room, waiting to hear what the final roster would be. One of the other coaches walked up and asked what was going on and why Newell was so flush in the face. Newell admitted that he might have just lost his opportunity to be the Olympic coach because he just yelled at the entire committee. The committee, in the end, made the right decision. They gave the head coaching job for the Olympics to Pete Newell, and they also named Walt Bellamy to the team, giving Newell six of his all-star players to take 
take to Rome. And they also named Jerry Lucas from Ohio State to the team as well. That was a no-brainer. Lucas was a future Hall of Famer. But here are two NCAA players that were left off the team, future Hall of Famers John Havlicek, also of Ohio State, and Lenny Wilkins of Providence College. Now, all the way to the end, Havlicek was upset that he did not get chosen for the team. Now, he did take solace in the fact that he won more NBA championships by himself, eight, than all of the 1960 Olympic players combined with just four. Now, from the military team, they added Adrian Smith, who had previously played for Adolph Rupp at the University of Kentucky. And once his military duty was complete, Adrian Smith went to the NBA and made one All-Star game. Now, from the amateur teams, they selected Lester Lane, Burdett Halderson, Alan Kelly, and Bob Boozer. Now, Boozer would also go to the NBA once the Olympics were done, and he also made an All-Star game. That makes a total of eight future NBA All-Stars on this Olympic team. So what happened to the team once they arrived in Rome? Again, I covered this more fully in episode 121, but to put it quickly, they absolutely destroyed everybody at the Olympics, going undefeated and defeating their opponents by an average margin of 42 points per game. Until the 1992 Olympic Dream Team with Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Larry Bird, the 1960 team was easily considered the greatest Olympic team of all time. But getting there had way more drama than it should have. After the 1960 selection tournament, the AAU's power shrank as the quality of their player dropped relative to the college players. In 1964, the AAU placed five players on the Olympic team. In 1968, they placed only two players. And by 1972, the team was made up completely of college players. And it would stay that way until 1992, when the Olympics allowed NBA players to participate. So, that was a glimpse into the power that the AAU held over amateur basketball in the United States and how it diminished over time as the skill of the AAU players dropped. Now, as I mentioned before, the AAU does not even have a men's division anymore. The NBA now has room for around 500 players and the ones that do not make it to the NBA end up playing in the G League or in perhaps an overseas professional league. Therefore, the top 1,000 or so American players players now use basketball to make a living. So there you have it. That is how we put together the 1960 U.S. Olympic team. And join us next time when we return to our occasional series of the lost teams of the ABA. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announced there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports historynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sports 
HistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.